river site geologic map, and this is a river here. Uh, power blocks is what we're talking about. These are bedding planes. Uh, there are sinkholes in this area. I'm the legal chair of the Tennessee chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, I'd like to go back to this envelope uh, question since there is no design that's even been submitted to the NRC or the Atomic Safety Licensing Board, and there are five or six potential designs uh, for these small modular reactors. Could you just tell us the, the other parameters where you'd be looking uh, as, as the worst case or the outside bounding of these things? Um, I talked to uh, Better earlier, and he mentioned, I think, uh, the way I wrote down was the footprint, the physical size. Um, I assume the, when we talk about water, we're talking about the amount of water necessary for cooling and operations, um, the uh, maximum thermal output, the maximum electric output, and are there some other factors that will be in this list of bounds that you'll be checking against? I find this particularly concerning because. Um, the one design that's been promised to be submitted to the NRC later this year by uh, New Scale uh, is a 50 megawatt underground small modular reactor, uh, which is designed to be used with up to 12 of them in a sort of a circular array. And, and what you have to consider in terms of environmental impacts and, and safety risk factors and so forth would seem to be very different whether you're talking about one or a dozen or something. So this, this boundary question of what's going to be, what TVA says is looked at in terms of the outside and, and, and provide you with uh, information in the application is of some concern. Not to prejudge the application, because like, the main reason we hear is the process like, to tell you the application is coming in. So we don't have the application in front of us. So we do have a regulatory process that we will do our full review in. And some of the questions you're asking, we don't have any um, information. We do have ideas of what may come in, but I don't want to expand on something that we don't have in front of us. So um, once application comes in, if it's docketed, it will be um, on the website for all to see. And any meetings, any uh, questions like that, that we, the staff, have or the public have, when we have public meetings on this particular issue or topic, it will be publicly noticed. We'll have a meeting with the applicant to ask additional questions. And then at the end of the meeting, then you can ask NRC staff directly any questions. But because the application is not in-house, I don't want to expand on um, what may have been in the application. Um. Yeah, this, this Alan Petter, I just want to add a little bit. When the application does come in, it will have a section of plan parameter envelope values which you'll be able to take a look at. Yes. So. Is there any list of, of things that have to be addressed as parameters? Could you just tell them from the beginning to tell us about this? That's Kenny, okay, Kenny. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, as I mentioned before, there's the, the thermal load, water use, electrical, um, there's a maximum precipitation event size. Um, there's a list of quite a few, so. Maybe it's yeah, useful. Yeah, if you, if you wanted to look at an example, PSCG, which we just reviewed, there's a, we have the whole um, list in the plant parameter envelope features, which will give you a, give you a, that's a good proxy to look at, even though the plant parameter envelope will be smaller in this case. And I can give you the specific, I can direct you to the website where that is. And we also have, um, I don't know if you picked this up, but in this pamphlet, if you look at the early side permit, there's a little section that talks about like the number of times and the power level, the plans for range, or possible plans planned that we consider as part of the early sign permit. So there is um, information that the applicant knows that they have to provide to NRC to us to all review. you. Uh, thank you, and um, I think it's worth emphasizing what Dan Barr said earlier is that if the applicant comes in later for to build it and operate a specific type of plan. It has to be within the box of the group, as Dan called it, the box. It has to be, yeah, because okay. that's finality. And if okay. it's not, we have to do another review. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go to this gentleman.
Hi, I'm Ed Engstrom. Uh, I have a somewhat of a follow-up question in that from an availability standpoint, you can see how there would be advantages to having multiple small reactors. But from a reliability engineering standpoint, having 12 opportunities to fail versus one might be problematic. So my question really is, is this really something new and different for NRC to be looking at uh, approving multiple small reactors as a package? And do you envision that you have to develop new models or new analytic techniques to deal with modular reactors? Or have you already started this with a different application? <laughs> We're currently we are using our current regulations that we have in front of us. We don't. There's nothing new. This is. Um, it might be a new technology, but the process will be following our process that we currently have in place. Uh, any other staff member would like to expand on that and on what I just stated? Well, maybe the question is uh, before we go to Dan Bar is. Uh, if we're talking about a potential number of small reactors, is that something that is in the early site application? I mean, do the they number of, the number of reactors still have small large reactors still have to fit in within that box. So if if they come in for eight, eight, um, 800 megawatts and they have to say they're going to put four within that box. If they come back and say our picture comes in in May and they say we want to do six, then we, they have to come back in. It's, so the number of reactors that they are proposing has to be within whatever NRC approved at that time. Okay. That's, yeah. that's they just all can't all come back and do yeah. They just can't add on. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Does anybody else want to add from NRC on this before we do? <coughs>
my uh, question then would be, what uh, can you tell us about the, um, the rulemaking procedures that have to do with the safety and security, the robustness of the containment, the force on force um, parameters for uh, a, a terrorist attack, for example, and many other um, issues that are important to this particular plan. Are you referring to the design certification rulemakings? Okay. Dan? I'll volunteer and <laughs> try to answer that one. Uh, a good question, good point of view. Um, the, the application, when we receive it, we expect it next month, will be evaluated based upon the regulations and the guidance that are in place today. Because we, we can't review on something that doesn't exist. Uh, so the applicant is preparing their application based on regulations and guidance, and we will review it based upon the regulation and guidance that exists. Uh, and, and we will finish, and whether we do or don't approve the permit, will be based upon the regulations and guidance that are in place for the permit. Uh, if those regulations and guidance change, as you mentioned, there is a, a companion rulemaking in at least the emergency planning area that is just starting. It'll take four or five years or more. Um, if that rule is in place and, and it changes some of those regulations, well, the requirement is when we issue final permit, it has to meet the regulations that are in place at the time that it's issued. So if there are changes in our regulatory process before the permit is issued, then those would have to be addressed. Uh, through the review process. Uh, so it, it, but whatever the, the, the permit is finally issued, assuming the commission finds it acceptable and, and does issue, it will be based upon the regulations that are in place at the time the permit is put in place. Follow-up? Uh, just a brief follow-up. I just, my, my uh, reason for coming today uh, is to offer assistance to any people here who are interested, who have questions or concerns about this whole procedure, the Blue Ridge Department of Defense League is here to help. We'd like to talk to people that have concerns that I haven't uh, talked about and others as well. Thank you. Ms. Elmer, uh, would you anticipate that the plan parameter envelope would, might have various options for how fuel, spent fuel, used fuel would be stored at the site? I mean, some of the designs would have different implications in terms of spent fuel, but is that something that's within the, the envelope? It's going to depend on the application that comes in. Initially, I suspect it will be just like sites that we have right now, which will either be stored in the spent fuel pool at the site. And the location of it, I don't have the address, but there is a map that TVA has provided out in the lobby area where you can see where the site will be located. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had a, a, a follow on because a lot of people are interested in putting fuel uh, and that's uh, because uh, the federal government has had uh, trouble with uh, selecting a site that the private sector is now um, showing an uh, intent to develop spent fuel storage capabilities in Texas. So that could be an interim disposition that's away from sites right now. So that's not the, the uh, that's, a, that's an interim step to get it away from sites. But of course, those applications have yet to come in. So just as far as, it, as many folks say, well, this stuff will never leave sites. That's another path that's a potential pathway to keep aware of in the news. Yeah, yeah Gary Morgan. Morgan uh, Along with several environmental groups, including the same group Mr. Zeller belongs to, uh, Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League, and also independent journalists. I have a question concerning uh, uh, the emergency planning zones. Of course, the current, uh, y'all's current guidelines is 10 and 25 miles regarding your, regarding your EPZs. Uh, noticing the map and presentation out there, nice presentation that TVA has made out there in the lobby. Here's a portion out there that shows a two mile EPZ. I realize there's no decision made on that, but down at the bottom of that, this is how I interpret a statement that is quoted from the NRC. Now this is not the exact statement, but this is how I interpret it. Is a scalable emergency planning zone seems appropriate. 
Now, have y'all made a preliminary decision that you're gonna go ahead and approve a two mile emergency planning zone outside of what is the current regulation? Thank you. Good, okay, glad we got that. Dan? Yes, Dan Bars, thank you for that question. Um, the, the current regulations uh, specify a emergency planning zone of 10 miles and 50 miles of congestion. That's what the regulatory requirement is. Uh, also built into that regulation though is a statement that uh, for a reactor that is 250 megawatts thermal or less or a gas cold reactor, it can be done on a case by case basis. So within the regulatory basis that we have today, uh, there is room to consider something less than the 10 mile. And in fact, we did license uh, Big Rock Point, which is now the decommissioned shutdown, Fort St. Vrain, another reactor, both had five mile emergency planning zones around that, those reactors. So this is not totally unique, different, or, or new. Uh, there have been smaller than 10 mile emergency planning zones. Uh, so it, it fits within the regulatory process, and we will follow the regulatory process. So we're in, when the, if the application comes in and, and we understand and expect it to, that they will propose a potential uh, two mile emergency planning zone, then that will be reviewed using the existing guidance and regulations. And if it's going to be less than the 10 mile, uh, then we'll use the case by case uh, basis and, and have to develop basically a site specific uh, exemption that would apply to this particular site uh, for that two mile emergency planning zone. Do you have any, any follow-up? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, TVA here, but I'm interested in, is TVA going to go through a similar public hearing process to solicit public input uh, from an economic standpoint and from a trade-off standpoint and why they chose modular reactors versus others? Because, uh, I mean, I have a lot of questions that probably are more appropriately to yeah, and that's, that's not unusual. There would be a lot of questions. I pointed out earlier, uh, TVA representatives are uh, here to talk to you after the meeting about that. But let me let me ask Dan. Dan, Stop, do you want to do you want to just address that concern since it's a pretty pretty basic to know who you are anyway. I'm Dan Stout. I'm a senior manager for TVA, responsible for small modular reactors. Um, TVA does not view an early site permit as something that requires a record of decision. It's not permission to build. Uh, as was mentioned by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, prior to constructing a, a reactor, there is another licensing step. And, and so that uh, TVA record of decision would be uh, part of a, that future step. Okay. So I, I think that's important for people to remember, um, not just from TVA standpoint, but from the NRC standpoint, is that there is going to be, uh, or maybe another step that is more specific uh, in terms of what might happen at that particular site. So thank you, Dan. Any, uh, Brian, and then see if we have someone out there again. Brian? I, I appreciate uh, NRC staff pointing to the PSEG early site uh, approval, and I've been glancing through it, uh, but there's a lot of documents. But um, one of the things it talks about was, uh, and this is in a site approval, the uh, projected need for electricity. And um, I wondered if you were going to address that because TVA has taken the position that it needs no new generating, baseline generating capacity of <coughs> until at least 2034 upon the expiration of its current integrated resource plan. So I wondered if you're going to uh, insist that they explain uh, why this generation is needed. We address the need for power in the follow-on environmental document. So this is an early site permit. We'll do an environmental impact statement for the site itself. 
then they will come back if they choose to go forward and, and build, and at that time we would, we would look at the need for power. So you're going to let TVA suck money out of the ratepayers for a long, long time before you ever decide or even look at the question about whether there's any need for the generation out of this facility. That's what I'm hearing. We have a specific process. There's two options or three options you can go through, and the, the applicant has chosen to do an urban site permit. Um, I can't speak to how that affects the particular ratepayers, but that's our regulatory process. Also, for an early site permit, um, an applicant does not look, need to look at uh, need for power at this point because it's uh, sort of analogous to one of the analogies I use is like a zoning permit. So the need for power can be shown later at the COL stage. If you want a detail, look at 5192 and explains the process and how when the application comes in for a combined license. Um, why need for power is necessary. So, like, like um, Alan and Pat said, this is just banking the site, and any business decisions outside that um, for need for power, they can't opt to put it in the combined license stage. And we have to look at that. And like I said, if there's additional information that's needed, we will add a request to that information. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Don Safer, I'm from Nashville. Tennessee Environmental Council and the state chapter Sierra Club in Tennessee chapter. Um, I the uh, the costs involved are troubling and uh, of this whole process. The cost of this meeting is being worn by TVA. It's my understanding that TVA is spending eight million dollars a year. Four million of that is DOE money uh, for this process. When as Brian just said, there's no need for power for uh, 15 or more years. Um, in the intervening time, renewables, the trend line of the cost of renewable power is going down. It's going down faster than the cost of nuclear power is going up. Even proponents of small modular reactors uh, at the Hoover Institute, uh, strong nuclear proponents, say that this Call it that. This, this whole uh, experimental project is not even begun to be possible financially without enormous expense by the federal government, the DOE in particular. And one of the ways is in this uh, grant that has been given to TVA uh, for this part of the process. But one of the other ways is the subsidization of the power by paying more than market prices for power the DOE to do that at Oak Ridge National Lab and at the Idaho National Lab, the only other place that I know of where small modular reactors are being considered. And uh, those subsidized power costs are recommended to go 20 or 30 years. And uh, the expectation is that it's going to take a $90 billion investment to get these small modulars off the ground in the way that they're supposed to be on paper economically viable with the factory actually building them, which is not going to be the case. So um, this is an interesting exercise, and it's one of the last gasps of the nuclear industry. But it's, it's really inconceivable that TVA is being drawn into this expenditure after it just lost several billion dollars on the Belafonte units three and four that it had to finally give up the licenses of. But it also has licenses of units one and two that are still um, existing. And TVA up until this year was spending $50 million a year to keep those licenses going. Um, so uh, I guess this is just a statement, not really a question. It's certainly not to the NRC because I know your job is just to make sure that it's safe. And you say you're not proponents of nuclear power, but I have to say honestly, in my experience with the NRC, which is fairly extensive, that you do tend to come out on their side and you do tend to um, soft pedal a lot of the issues that ought to be really looked at a lot more, with a lot more um, skepticism and uh, analytics. And I realize that there are political pressures on the NRC to approve licenses and there's an enormous political pressure to get this thing going on small modulars because of the 
miserable experience of the AP 1000s uh, in South Carolina and Georgia. And I will say that TVA was supposed to be the lead builder of the AP 1000 reactors, which are now years behind schedule and billions of dollars over budget. And the last thing I'll say is TVA is just now finishing Wasbar Unit 2, a reactor that took 42 years to build and has not had a single watt of electricity generated for the grid, and they've already had their first emergency fire that went over 30, almost 30 minutes. And that reactor cost somewhere 15 times what it was expected to cost when it was originally proposed. So the huge cost, not to mention the spent fuel, which I can't get over using the term spent fuel for something that is so enormously radioactive, it's a master of deceptive language. But in any case, I realize that the NRC doesn't really, this is not your purview, and, and at this point we're just talking about the early site application, but I wanted to point out to people that this process could take easily 15 years, and that's not going to help us on climate change. I have a question about water. Maybe cool off time. <laughs> um, the, uh, there was a, men a mention earlier about uh, concerns about water temperatures, and um, I just note that that water intakes for this, uh, it seems to me, are going to be in the Clinch River, both the intake and discharge, unless it uses completely evaporative cooling uh, and has no discharge. And um, the Clinch River is full of deep legacy settlement sediments having uh, with all kinds of PCBs, radioactives, uh, and most recently coal ash, including all of the metallic elements that are toxic. Uh, so um, I would hope that the environmental impact statement, and I will be there for the scoping hearing, but would, would address, um, and I would hope that TVA in its application would address um, how to deal with, with building intake and discharge uh, and what that will be like uh, in a river that you don't want to be in. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I should say on the status of the uh, other mountain. Um, I guess the first question, the number of sites where spent fuel is stored on site, we'll go to Scott Brunel from Office of Public Affairs. And maybe you can do all that. Mr. Senator, I'm Scott Brunel, I'm with the Poetry of the Agency. In terms of spent fuel stored on site, it's currently happening at every operating reactor site. There are currently 61 of those. There are several other decommissioned sites. The application from waste control specialists in Texas is pending. I don't have a, a certain date when that would come in, but that would be for an interim storage facility to potentially consolidate the spent fuel that's stored around the country. In terms of our mountain, the NRC has completed its technical review of the Department of Energy's application. The next step would be 